welcome everybody. Thank you so much as ever for, for coming and watching and taking you and your valuable sharing your valuable time with, with us. Um, whether that's live or whether that's in the future, I, it's just so appreciated and I'm really, really grateful for us coming together to, to share this space with Mia today. Um, I met Mia when I was interviewing and running the, the Global Existential Summits and it's just been such a pleasure to stay connected and what she has uh, to offer us today is just absolutely beautiful but I'm not going to take ages and witter on, I'm going to just hand it over and welcome Mia and invite you to introduce yourself however feels right for you Mia, thank you so much for being here. Thank you Natalie. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my uh, presentation. I did put together some slides to just help facilitate the workshop for us today. And so bear with me while I pull this up. And then I will also share with you a little bit about uh, myself and what we have uh, ahead of us today. I'm super excited. I hope everybody, you've all brought your art supplies because this is an interactive workshop and you're going to have an opportunity to create your own art as well as an opportunity to see some of my art. Um, so as Natalie shared, my name is Mia Burrows. I um, have been an existential existentialist Pretty much my whole adult life, I started in high school with um, interest in existentialism because I wanted to um, take greater ownership of my life and and do that through choice, right? That power of choice. Uh, I haven't pursued that as a career. I'm a mom. I'm a professional human resources person as a, um, in terms of my work. It has very much been, though, a process of how I, I stay in health and stay in my own space. And in this process of um, abstract art and the activity we're going to do today is illustrative of that. This is something that I do myself almost weekly. So with that, uh, we're going to jump in and um, kind of go through the workshop schedule. So... We're going to start with talking about art as meaning creation, a very existential idea, right? Because within existentialism, we all create our own meaning and purpose and then choose accordingly. Um, so I see art as meaning creation, looking out in the world, and what we create is reflective of what's meaningful and important to each of us individually as the artist. Uh, we're going to go through um, some language in, in abstract art. Abstract art, I think, is, is a unique experience for me in that it, is, it gives me opportunity to tap into some pre-verbal or very visceral um, experience and represent that in form without labeling it first. And it, it's, it's pretty challenging to tap into that space because we are, as, as humans, uh, very driven by language and by labeling and that uh, kind of acquisition. But if you do that too quickly, you might miss um, what's going on emotionally in your unconscious and, and in a, a kind of uh, more pre-verbal uh, part of who we are as human beings. And I believe that stays with us all through our life and not only, uh, you know, when you're so young that you're pre-verbal. Uh, we're going to take some opportunity to actually create our own uh, abstract art today. So there'll be 20 minutes where each of us uh, can, can um, create art. I have watercolors and ink is the, my medium of choice, though pastels, you know, um, are excellent colored pencils, anything that makes marks. <laughs> I think that if you have the option of color, that does help, but it is, even that's not necessary. And, and you'll see as we go forward, um, kind of the meaning of choosing a, a grayscale per se, if that is your choice. To pick. Then actually Natalie is gonna talk with us a little bit about the power of naming art. You know, so you go from that abstract, pre-verbal kind of guttural place of creating the abstract art trying, I actually intentionally try not to think and recognize recognizable images when I go through that process. But then when you bring it forth and you, you name the piece, it's a process of bringing to consciousness what you've discovered in that kind of 
um, process of creating art. And then we'll have 10 minutes time, each of us individually to name the artwork. And then we're actually going to send it, it depends on the numbers of everybody who joins us, but we're going to have an opportunity in small group to uh, talk about the art we've created, the names we've chosen, and kind of what uh, we gained in this experience. What questions do you have about the schedule? Any, any concerns, questions before I continue forward? Okay, wonderful. I'll keep going. So this poem by Emily Dickinson, I Dwell in Possibility, is one of my favorites. It's actually one that I memorized pretty early in life and is related very much to the title of the workshop, I, I Dwell in Mystery, and highlights um, a reality that I believe, which is that... Um, Instead of being, you know, I am Mia, I know what that is, it's a, is a set thing. The truth is, is that Mia Burroughs was somebody as a child, somebody in high school, somebody on my wedding day, somebody after having a child, and all of those are different um, human beings in a way, because I change and move. We're very much more verbs <laughs> in the world than nouns, despite that kind of acquisition naming activity, which we all participate in. Uh, all the time. So I'm making and just showing up and trying to be in that mysterious space and dwell in the possibility of what comes forth. And art creation is very much engaging in this activity uh, because I, I don't know if you have experienced this, but I certainly have. You are about to create something, there's a blank page, there's a nothing, and then there's a something that's an idea and you create it and all of a sudden it comes into being and it may or may not relate at all to what you were thinking when you started the process. That's kind of falling in, in possibility for me. Um, and this is a wonderful poem. Just for the sake of time, I'm not gonna read it through, but I invite you to keep track of it and go back to it. It's words that go through my mind pretty regularly. Um, Emily Dickinson, of course, is wonderful. I also want to highlight a quote by Nice Nin, this idea that um, each friend represents a world in us that would not um, have been born or we would never have known if we didn't have that meeting. And I want to kind of invite you to consider the idea that if you're, you're not engaging in activities of self-knowledge, there's a whole world within yourself that could also go unknown, right? And um, this activity we're doing today in art creation is an opportunity to meet yourself and see that world within you. So I highlight that idea of a friend. And there's actually just another reference, Rumi, the poet, uh, 13th century poet, in his relationship with Shams, uh, talked about the friend within too, in that other people can reflect for us that kind of essential self is within us. But anyways, it's a process of discovery I have found. I have a quote here by Merleau-Ponte. Merleau-Ponte is a contemporary of Sartre and um, Simone de Beauvoir and Camus. And one of the things I really love about Merleau-Ponte and his writing on phenomenology is that he emphasizes that it starts in human experience, in really pre-verbal human experience. He's one of the few philosophers of that time that really actually talks a lot about children and childhood experience. And one of the ways I really resonate with that is that I think that existential experience is human experience and that philosophers simply named it, cataloged it, and have beautifully talked about it. I, I read a lot of philosophy, definitely encourage that. And yet I still think it is alive and well with people who maybe don't even know of the philosophers, right? It's it's a human experience. And that through art, he he recognizes through art, we go through bringing it from pre-verbal into this recognizable um, form. And so I wanted to highlight that. And then to kind of bring the, the experience together, Mark Rothko, uh, painter, he presents this idea that painting is not a picture of experience, it is the experience. And that's what I would love to invite 
you all to participate in today is art as an experience and not just as representation of, of um, experience. Um, wonderful. Feel free, we want this to be interactive. So Natalie, if you wanna jump in or anybody else wants to jump in, if you can put notes in the chat as well, um, please feel free to ask questions or engage as well as we go through. Okay, wonderful. So next I'm gonna share with you some of my artwork and highlight vocabulary and abstract art. The ways that your choices, even if it's not recognizable form, um, still elicits a response in the viewer. And that's kind of my idea of the difference between like sentiment and art. It's art when it's out there in the world elicits a response from uh, a viewers and that engagement with those people who can see um, the art. So this is one that I, I did um, a while back. And um, I always create first and then after the creation, step back, engage with it and say, oh, what does this say to me? So I'm trying to not jump to the, the concepts or naming earlier. This one, after I finished this painting, it's warm colors. Um, it's, there's no kind of hard barriers or, or lines. And um, when I see this, I think of what, what the experience is of with your face up to the sun and your eyes closed, right? That um, the way the sun filters through your eyelids. And um, this one's particularly personal, a, an abstract self-portrait if you, if you would, because my full name, Numia, means the light you see when you close your eyes. And um, so that was the name that I gave uh, this piece. So keep in mind as we go forward, this is your experience of warm colors and um, that gives a, a definite experience for the viewer. This on the other hand is in the, the cooler scale of colors and it's also uh, got some uh, chaotic elements. I have a sense of, of like a geyser or, <laughs> or a, an explosion or, or something um, happening in, in this piece and definitely very different from the last one that, that I just shared with you. And this one I call in the storm. So I almost imagine right in the, in the center of, of all that, that chaotic activity. So this is another example of how just by color choice and um, the, the energy that you put on the page gives meaning in abstract art. I wanted to think about lines, right? Um, you saw actually in the last one, you had a straight line in the middle, even though there was this chaotic sense of an explosion, there was a straight line, which gives you a sense of horizon and tends to um, elicit this thought about um, above and below. Um, as I said, a horizon, you got sky and land and a divider, it can represent that. And so when you're thinking of creating even if it's not a recognizable form, having lines that go across or horizontal on the page gives a certain sense of meaning for the viewer. Angles, um, clear angles or boxes um, give a very uh, distinct meaning as well. It presents questions of what's inside, what's outside um, and, and cuts up space, right? So you have, um, Meaning that's related to that circular lines give you a whole other feeling in relation to the world. Might think of, of rolling hills, gives a sense of um, circles. If it's closed, you get a sense of um, the seasons potentially, everything that's cyclical that we have in our life. And so circles have meaning. Irregular curved lines would, would bring up the idea of a broken circle. And what does that mean? And um, and what I'm trying to elicit, and hopefully this is working in your mind, is that even though they're abstract form, there are there's a vocabulary here that resonates in terms of the kind of um, cumulative experience that one would bring to the viewing of art. And intersecting lines makes you think of like a crossroads, makes you think of Xing, maybe Xing something out. 
and so has uh, a meaning in itself. You can also have a sense of um, perspective, like um, with intersecting lines where you would have maybe something on top and something below. Uh, jagged lines have, have also a very uh, specific experience, may make you think of a, a knife or make you think of something being torn apart. Uh, and then I'm gonna just share some of my artwork again that gives you kind of a sense of, of lines, right? And what I did with lines. Um, and these are called the one with the circles was mind spinning. I thought that that was a neat visual example of what my brain does sometimes. <laughs> um, the other one is primary colors. And I liked the, the boxes as well as the solid colors because primary colors, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, give a sense of harmony and order. And then the last one is what we keep in boxes. And I was thinking of kind of layered emotional experience of where I box things inside of myself. So those are the names of those um, paintings. As I mentioned, primary colors, I think are very powerful. And when you have primary colors in one um, piece of art, it automatically gives a feeling of harmony. You have both warmth and you have both cool and you have a place where things are merging and interacting with each other. So I often uh, paint with primaries and that's it. Um, when I'm creating creating art, you can do a lot of uh, other colors by starting with your primaries. And this one I, I titled, um, Here is a Conversation. So I was thinking a conversation between um, your different warm and cold and different elements within your primary colors. And then finally, I do wanna just introduce the idea of grayscale, right? Grayscale, you get a sense of light and dark much more intensely because there isn't the uh, variation of color to make that less clear. Uh, I, I've often said that when I'm not creating in my life, the world goes into grayscale versus when I'm creatively engaging with everything, I, I see that expanse of color. So there is a starkness, I think, within use, choosing grayscale. Uh, this is an example of a painting that I did in grayscale. and. I wanted to play with both the starkness of the grayscale with something that reminded me of smoke or fog or movement. Um, because also tension in, in art is something that's picked up by the viewer and I think quite interesting. So this one I called the dance. Uh, so I've covered a whole lot. And what I'm gonna actually ask you to do next is clear your mind, right? We've been very much in our mind, been thinking about all these things, and that's fun and interesting. And yet still with the art creation portion of the workshop, I'm hoping you can let it all go and then just feel and have those feelings come onto the page in a an organic way. So I have a few uh, points of encouragement as you enter into this portion of the workshop to see if we can kind of uh, create this experience or, or if I can share this experience with you. So once we get started, just create, let the thoughts float. You know, if any of you have, have um, done meditation, it's very similar, you know, thoughts still come, but you're like, oh, a thought, and then it floats like a cloud. Be impulsive, you know, so if you have colors or you have, just do something. It might surprise you. I love in creativity where I am surprised. I'm like, where the heck did that come from? But that's kind of cool. And then I roll with it, right? So enter into what I call flow space, which is when you're so engaged in what you're doing that you're, you're not thinking about it anymore. And let the brush strokes or the marks surprise you on the page and then um, kind of lead you into the next uh, choice without getting too uh, attached to what what's actually happening on the page. And if you see a recognizable image, the brain is wired to look for recognizable images. So even if you intend to go abstract, a lot of times faces emerge, shapes emerge. What I'll do is I'll turn the page and change the perspective to try to get myself out of that acquisition headset, which is a, a temptation for sure. 
uh, if you can let go of conscious understanding, step into that pre-verbal, you know, where you're, where it's color and texture and shape and feeling and relate as you're in the kind of art experience. These are my invitations to you, not a prescription, just an invitation. And then of course, breathe. Breathing helps everything. <laughs> breathe, create, and breathe some more. For uh, our art session, we're going to stay all in the same room, um, but you'll have this opportunity. As I said, I hope you have your art supplies. I am going to be timing it. We're going to give us, ourselves 20 minutes, myself included, and Natalie to uh, create our own art today. And um, one of the things I like to do is listen to music. So I'm going to be playing through Zoom, Choying Drama and Steve Tibbetts. Choying Droma's songs, I think, are really wonderful because I don't understand the lyrics. <laughs> and it's just a feeling. And yet I've heard her speak and I know that what she's singing about is freedom and peace, both of which are, are drives within me in, in terms of living in the world. So um, with that, what questions do you have about this portion of the workshop? Joanna, go for it. Hi there. Um, I find that if I sit quietly and reflect on my inner experience, when I'm then faced with a blank page, I immediately then go back into my head and I'm thinking about what I'm creating. And I don't know how to sort of channel my inner experience onto the page without just going straight back into my head. I um, I understand that very well. And I've, I, I used to um, kind of hit that space as well. There's, there's no wrong marks. So usually at that point in time, I just, I might even look away, go in, if I'm using pencils or charcoal, grab randomly, to start, you know, even like a, a kind of a chaotic thing or a line, I really try to just start making marks, start um, actually engaging in it and bypass that hesitancy which is you're thinking you know can I do it right am I doing it right do I do this do I do that what do I do um I don't know if that's helpful but um I work fast um I'm not saying that that you need to do it that way but I in in part it's to bypass the brain's need to catalog and organize it and pre prescribe for me thank you <laughs> If I can just add to that, I think we have a tendency to get frustrated at our frustration. And so we, we, we're we like, oh, that's come for me. And oh, but it's that's not the time and place for it. I'm supposed to not be thinking about thinking. And then we can think about thinking about that and we can get frustrated. And so we can find ourselves building up layers. And I think rather than rather than kind of leaning into it, if you just send it love, send it forgiveness for coming up, send it you know, uh, just compassion and maybe if there's a mantra that is helpful for you or just something that you can invite yourself to not need to lean into that. It's it, everything is OK, right? Everything is safe. And so, you know, it, it, I don't know if this is just something that comes for me as well. There really are no wrong choices. I mean, that's one of the freedoms of abstract art is like you can have a blank page with two marks and it still could be very um, impactful ineffective there's not a wrong there's no um you know standard in the world that tells you it needs to look like this so that can be really freeing if you step into that space is there any other questions or or comments that you want to share with us before we start creating Okay, wonderful. I'm excited about um, this portion of the workshop. I'm going to put on some music and start the, the timer. We have 20 minutes, so um, enjoy, create, and um, 
yeah, just go for it. So we are coming to the closure of the 20 minutes. It always goes by fast when I'm in, absorbed <laughs> into the experience. If we're ready, we'll come back together. I went to the next slide when I wasn't quite ready, but here we are. Um, I'm going to pass it actually to Natalie, who's going to talk a little bit about now that we've gone through this experience of creating the abstract art, um, the power of, of naming and, and thinking about a name for what we've created. Thanks, Mia. I think you're gonna have to um, do the PowerPointing. Yes, yep. You want me to go to the next, yep. Thank you, yes. So. I think Mia's mentioned it before um, in, in her presentation that as humans, we have the tendency to to find meaning, to name things, to identify things. Um, when she was given the, the encouragement and the ideas of um, trying to get away from doing that while we're, we're, while we're engaging with the art. But this uh, next part of the, the session today invites us to, uh, to name. And um, as the slide says, we've been, that human have been naming in order to gain acquisition since the dawn of time. Um, when we're thinking of of naming, what came up for me is plenty of things, but especially if we're, I know many of our audience are relating to existential therapies. When so I I I and myself, I'm a you know an existential orientated therapist. We think of of the power of naming um, what's going on for us as a way to validate what's going on for us, as a way to, I think, specifically move the the intangible to a place of tangibility. Um, to we we bring light of things, we help gain a deeper understanding um, of of things when we name it. And yeah, to name something is to get to know something, to get to know something within ourself. If we're thinking about abstract art by naming something that we we're, we're recognizing on the page we're getting we're able to to know ourselves something that came from within something that we didn't like Mia says sup we've surprised ourselves we, we've invited a blank piece of paper to transform into something and something has come organically and innately from us um we bring the unconscious feeling into conscious understanding um we bring the 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 Ironically, you know, the abstract art can bring clarity to abstraction and complexity within us. Um, and I think Mia earlier was saying that it's we, we can see the energy that's come from ourselves onto the page and to, to, to notice a name. We can we can see what that energy, which is obviously so again intangible we can see and name what that energy might mean what those abstract feelings might mean um to name is to bring into a catalog of known objects or ideas and yes it gives something a more recognizable meaning and part of the power of that is that when we can recognize something when we can make meaning of something when we can make sense of something if we need to we can do something with it when when it's when it's something that is just going on within us and we're unable to name it, we're unable to recognize it, we're unable to have a conscious understanding of it, it can feel sometimes like it has control of us, power over us, whereas in a sense we can reclaim power if necessary when we name. But over to you, Mia. So absolutely well said, Natalie. Um, and in here, I just included a quote from, from Nietzsche, from Gay Science, in which he's talking about what is originality, to see something that has no name as yet and hence cannot be mentioned, although it stares us all in the face, like the, the paintings we've just completed. And the way that, that humans usually are, it takes a name to make something visible to them. So we're going from abstract into conscious thought of, of what it is that we've all created. And so this is, a, again, a, a, one of my artworks. And um, I named it the backside of a sad face, which to me, it, anyways, it resonates. 
um, um, with me as um, giving the, the image much more meaning once the title comes forward. And so now we get to name our artwork. Um, so wonderful. Thank you. So I could, um, the last few slides, I don't think we need to go back. I have um, some Facebook groups. If any of you are out in that social media space and want to connect on existentialism, um, I have a, an art collaborative and then existential literature, art, music, and film are the two groups. The existential group is 135 thousand members, which is kind of mind blowing to me. I started it before the pandemic. <laughs> I don't know where all these people came from. <laughs> uh, but it's still a really enjoyable space, I think, out in in um so if you know if that interests you, I find it really a wonderful place to be alone and connect with people. So that's why social media really speaks to me. And I do a lot of sharing of my poetry and artwork in those spaces and, and curate those spaces so that they're wonderful virtual coffee shop spaces to hang out in, not all of social media is that way. Um, and so I think that was it. Uh, Natalie and I are thinking of other possible workshops to, to have. Um, right now, I'm actually doing more of what I call interpretive portraits and um, I could share the screen essentially what it is it's very existential i think so the the abstract art is looking inward the interpretive portrait is looking outward and looking at somebody who who i know and who trusts me to um try to look beyond just the image and it usually uh includes some other references the one i had in the slide deck is is of my uh, friend sammy So um, that's one of the ideas is to do a workshop um, on interpretive portraits. So that's one idea. And then the other is existentialism, uh, existential philosophy and its impact on the arts. And I think post-World War II, it's incredibly significant, the impact of um, the idea of individual perspective, individual meaning, purpose, choice. And you see it in art literature and film very profoundly. So those are some ideas. Um, so we'll see.
I am so grateful for everybody for coming along today. It's been such a treat. This has been especially lovely to see in and the, the, these, you know, tangible images that we come up with in such a short space together and the fact that we're all around the world, you know, making art together. And a special thank you, of course, to Mia for, for creating this space for all of us. Um, truly appreciate it. And thank you so much for what you do. Yeah. Thank you. I um, um, have been inspired by you and I really wanted to spend time with um, fellow spirits. I feel like I have indeed found my tribe in, in, in words with Natalie's existential, global existential tribe. So thank you. <laughs>